the pastor always to allow the preacher to make the decision and not the pastor to make the decision. And we want to take the handcuffs off of you and absolutely turn you loose and just let God manifest himself in your life and give us one victory after another. Praise God. I do want to thank all of you for being here and uh, thank the Lord for the touch of God. This morning I'm, I want to direct your attention to the book of Luke, the sixth chapter. And um, they will put my scripture on the screen for me, Luke 6. I always send these ahead. And go down to the, um, if you would, drop down to the uh, 20th verse of Scripture. Verse 20. The Bible says, And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed be ye, poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. We're going to read on now. Blessed are ye that hunger now, for ye shall be filled. Blessed are ye that weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are ye when men shall hate ye, and when they shall separate you from their company, and shall reproach you and cast you out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Then it says, Rejoice ye in that day, and leap for joy. Everybody say, Leap for joy. Behold, your reward is great in heaven. For in the like manner did their fathers unto the prophets. Next verse. But woe unto you that are rich, for you have received your consolation. Verse 25. Woe unto you that are full, for you're going to hunger. Woe unto you that laugh now, for you're going to mourn and weep. It says, woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you. For so did their fathers of the false prophets. And then, but I say unto you, which, I, which hear, love your enemies, do good to them which hate you, bless them that curse you, pray for them that despitefully use you, yeah, and unto him that smiteth thee on the one cheek, offer also the other <laughs> unto him, and to him that taketh away your cloak, give him your coat to go along with it. Then it says, give to every man that asketh thee, and of him that taketh away thy goods, ask them not again. And as ye would that men should do to you, do you also to them likewise. And I'm going to stop right there in the reading. Here's our lesson this morning. is following the teachings of Jesus. And if you would now put Luke 6 and 46 up, and we will read that portion of Scripture. And why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? I'm going to talk to you this morning about following the teachings of Jesus. Turn and look at your neighbor and say, Jesus gives good advice. Hallelujah. Turn to somebody else and say, I like what Jesus says. Let's just be honest. Turn to somebody else and say, sometimes it's tough, but it's worth it. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, clap your hands to the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Praise God. You may be seated. Anybody here remember learning to ride a bicycle? How many of you can still ride a bicycle? They say riding a bicycle is like learning to tread water. Once you learn to tread water, you just do it as a second instinct if you're getting water over your head. A little boy by the name of Cotton one time, his daddy put trainer wheels on his trike. Any of you have trainer wheels? Any of you? They weren't that good to me when Sister Jamie had trainer's wheels. They, they weren't that good to me. They just put me out there on a bike and 
After you wreck the thing four or five times, you finally figure out what the answer is. My brother used to ha-ha and he at me, come on. You know, <laughs> sometimes my brother teased me a little rash. and Sometimes he'd go in and he'd say, Mother, I want you to get your rat out of my hair. Every now and then, Shelton would say, ha-ha, rat, you wrecked again. But nevertheless, it, it, he finally was the one that told me, when you fall to the left, turn to the left. It'll straighten up. If you're falling to the right, turn to the right. It'll straighten up. I finally figured out that in spite of his teasing, he knew what he was talking about. This little boy by the name of Cotton had trainer wheels on his bike. And uh, he would ride it along, and man, he was feeling good about it, Brother Allen, as long as he won a smooth, paved surface. And uh, one day he didn't pay much attention, and he veered off, and he ended up in the yard. What he didn't realize about the yard was that there had been moles in the yard. Any of you have to, ever had to fool with moles? You know, they tunnel around, make the ground soft, sometimes make little ditches out of sight. His trainer wheel dropped over in one of those holes and he just went tumbling out in the yard. So there he was, laying out in the middle of the yard. Dad come out to get him and uh, he got him back up on the sidewalk. Another day, he got all excited. He thought he'd ride his, try set his bike down the hill. He started down the hill, couldn't control it. And finally, he, his front wheels dropped in one of those gouges and and his bike just automatically just suddenly stopped and he went right over the handlebars. None of y'all ever had that to happen, have you? Oh yeah, Billy said. Oh yeah. And so, so it was that. Well, finally he figured it out. Just like when Chilton finally explained it to me. So he started riding it. In the Old Testament, everybody say the law. The law was such a strict, rigid, structured lesson that it actually was training wheels. In fact, the Bible says the law was the schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. It was so that we would know the limits and the barriers and, and the things that would straighten us up. But when you get to Jesus Christ, when the Lord came, He didn't, what He actually did, was he nailed those, he, he nailed them to a cross and he gave us teachings as to understand in ourselves what our limits are. When you understand in yourself what your limits are, he, you, you said it well this morning, Brother Kuntzman, receiving this Holy Ghost puts you into this thing called the church, the kingdom of God. When you move into the church, with the Holy Ghost is in you. It said the Holy Ghost would lead and guide you into all truth. Also, the presence of the Holy Ghost in you becomes a limiter to your own ambition. Now, when we tell you it becomes a limiter to your own ambition, there's something that you've got to realize. It's very, very, very important. The Bible talks about this in the book of Peter. It said some have seared their conscience with a hot iron. You can ignore the prompting of the Holy Ghost long enough that it doesn't bother you any longer to do things that you shouldn't do. It's very, very important that you stay sensitive to the leading of the Holy Ghost. So what the Lord Jesus does in the book of Matthew 5, 6, and 7 at the fabulous Sermon on the Mount, and also this is a, this is a Luke's rendition of it in Luke the 6th chapter. He gives us these guidelines to help us learn the value of things living for God. One of the great things that you're going to learn about being blessed is this, is that the blessing of God wants to make your life go well. Now you and you, if you ignore the limitations of the scripture, and the limitations of your walk with God, if you ignore it, you're going to wonder how in the name of heaven and earth did I end up in this kind of a mess. The truth of the matter is, if you will abide by the directives of God, 
It allows you to be a blessed individual. A blessed individual. Everybody say a blessed individual. And I want to be blessed. And in wanting to be blessed, one of the things that I've learned is this. The longer that I live for God, the more that I understand this. That the values of Jesus Christ are totally opposite to the values of this world. This world values things. Well, the Bible actually said this. It said the wisdom of this world. The wisdom of this world is foolishness to God. And what this world causes foolishness for being a Christian is the wisdom of God. So it is that we bring ourselves. If they would, I'd like for them to put Luke, the sixth chapter, verses 22 and 23, back on the screen. Luke 6, 22 and 23, I'll read it again. Blessed are ye when men shall hate you, and when they shall separate you from their company, and shall reproach you, and cast out your name as evil for, as the, son of, for the Son of Man's sake. Next verse, it said, Rejoice ye in that day, and leap for joy. Behold, your reward is great in heaven, for in the like manner did they to your your fathers did to the prophets, or their fathers did to the prophets. Saying this to you is this. Saints, when you don't fit in, don't get in the mully grubs. When your lifestyle, somebody ridicules it, gives you a hard time, makes fun of you. Now, I don't know if any of y'all have been made fun of for being an apostolic, but I have. I have been ridiculed. I've been called a holy roller. I've had, I had them uh, tell me that I was a holier than thou. And all of those things. Just because there was some things growing up I refused to do. Well, here's a scripture that says, when you are isolated by people, and when people give you a hard time for being a Christian, then the thing for you to do is to rejoice. It actually said here, leap for joy. Be happy about it because what you're doing is you are companying. Everybody say companying. I am keeping company with the prophets of the Old Testament. That's what they did to them. I'd rather be great with God and God know my name than have the whole world know my name and my name be not on the Lamb's book of life. Those are the things that's important. Living for God. Taking a stand for him. And I want you to know, this thing that we are involved in gives us eternal ownership of the great things of God. When we say eternal, I want you to know that our, the way we respond to it is very, very important. I want you to look at Acts the 5th chapter and verse 41. I want you to watch how that these men responded to being persecuted. And they departed from the presence of the council. Next word, what's it say? Rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Mark it down. He said it. You're not going to change it. This is the way it is. You're going to be hated of all men for his name's sake. There's people that they'll, they'll tell you lots of things. They don't mind saying Christ. They don't mind saying Lord. But they don't want you to say Jesus. Uh, I've been asked to pray at several state affairs. Inauguration of governors. Opening the United States Senate. Opening the House of, of, of Delegates. Opening the State Senate. I, I've been in several settings for that. I've been in dedications of bridges with a lot of officials around. They always warn me. Preacher, do not reference God by name. I'm sorry, you asked the wrong guy to pray. His name is Jesus. And it's the only name given under heaven among men whereby you must be saved. For he hath given him a name that is above every name. For at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Oh, hallelujah. Having said that, you see, there's something about just go rejoicing. You know, 
There's a time when you know you're right. When you're doing everything that's in the book and somebody's picking on you, just take a deep breath and say, I know I'm right. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. If this world doesn't love what you're doing, just keep on doing what's right. It'll get you there. And as we go for it, I want you to know, look at John 15 and 20. Brother Harper, you're talking about following Jesus and it sounds like you're telling us what a drab life being a Christian is. Well, remember the words that I said unto you. The servant is not greater than his Lord. And if they have persecuted me, speaking of Jesus, they will also persecute you. And if they have kept my sayings, they will keep yours also. Simply saying this, if you're going to be involved in the battle of the Lord, choose where you're going to live. I'm going to live on the Lord's side. How about you? So what is it that makes peace? Many, many people act in the, they act in the role of Christians out of selfish motives. I don't believe any of you do, but there are people, for instance, a few years ago, the political world, every politician coming down the pike said he was born again. You remember that? Every one of them said he was born again. They talked about doing this right and doing that right. Well, I want you to know something. Living for God is not a sham in the front room and a devil in the back room. Is that all right? Is that the right way to say it? You see, you, you, let, me, let me tell you what. There's got to be a level of consistency in our life. Now, we're going to have temptations. Turn and look at your neighbor next to him. Just look at him. Say, have you ever been tempted? You don't have to answer that. I just wanted to wake it up down inside of us. And I don't want you to ask this question. Because I'm afraid somebody will answer. Have you ever succumbed? Don't answer. You got to tell anybody about it. Tell it to Jesus and tell it to Jesus alone. And what I want to tell you is this. Is in life, doing right things is good. And you may stumble. But the Bible says that the word of God is a sharp two-edged sword, cutting both coming and going, dividing asunder the joint and the marrow. It also is divide, said dividing asunder the soul and the spirit. But the grand one is this. It divides asunder the thought and the intent of your heart. I'll go back to a JW-ism. That's my daddy. He used to say, boy, he said, I know that sometimes we think things we shouldn't think. But he said, thoughts is like a bird flying over your head. He said, a bird flying over your head is a thought you have. What you got to make sure is you don't let the bird build a nest in your hair. So there's a difference between having a thought and having an abiding intent. You can have a thought, but don't have an abiding in, uh, intent of deception or something wrong, or something not good, or something that's out of step. When you live your life, live your life with this intention, I'm going to live for Jesus. Then, then the scripture will help you make up your mind about your lifestyle. Even if you stumble, there's nobody in here that intends on going to hell. Nobody in here intends on being lost. And so let your, let the thoughts of the things of this world that can entrap you and destroy your soul, let them be thoughts, but don't let them become a lifestyle. I like living for Jesus. How about you? I like the thoughts of streets of gold. How about you? And with the value that goes with that, it brings us to this, that the values of the world are not always the best for us. 
You see, I know a lot of people. Remember the story of the rich man and Lazarus? The rich man and Lazarus is one of the most shocking stories that I know in the Bible. Here's why. The rich man goes to hell. There's not a person in here can tell me which of the Ten Commandments that the rich man broke. There's none there. But he went to hell. And the deciding factor comes in something that Father Abraham told him. He said, in this world, in, this, in, in the world that you've lived in, he said, you had all the blessings and comforts of life. And at your gate, there laid a man by the name of Lazarus. And in spite of all your comfort, you didn't do anything to take care of the beggar at your gate. Folks, our walk with God is not just about gaining stuff for ourselves, but it's about sharing and having compassion on everybody that we're around. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as you're very good. Hallelujah. That's what you got to do. Love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, whenever that you see somebody in need. In fact, in the book of Isaiah, I think it's 56, he writes a, a whole chapter there on what fast does the Lord really honor. Does the Lord honor the fast where that you go without food for days, maybe weeks in an extended fast? He said, the fast that I have chosen is that when you see those around you in need, take of what you've got and share with them. It's important to understand the value of that and the value of that. Look at Luke 6 and 24. I'll read it again to you. I think it's important to read. But woe unto you that are rich, for you've received your consolation. Go ahead and put that 25th verse up there now. But woe unto you that are full, for you shall hunger. And woe unto you that laugh, for you shall mourn and weep. All of that is a direct reference to the man who is Dives, or the rich man that went to hell. I want you to know, you may think this world is just a party. And you may laugh at people, make fun of people, insult people, give people a hard time. But don't you believe that that's the way it's always going to be? Sometime you're going to get sick. I'm not just saying, I'm saying you as, as, a, as a universal statement, not you as individuals. But sometimes you're going to get sick. Sometimes you're going to feel bad. Sometimes you're going to have a challenge. Sometimes you're going to hurt. Sometimes you're going to have some weariness. Praise God. But I'll tell you what. Everybody say, sow a few seeds. Sow a few seeds of kindness. That's right. That's right. For whatsoever you sow, that shall you also reap. Uh, it don't, it's not a bad thing to sow a smile. It's not a bad thing to put your arm around somebody and love them. It's not a bad thing to help somebody when they're in trouble. You never know when the fortunes of life are going to turn on you. And then out of nowhere, you need help. But if you've sown, everybody say sown. He that sows bountifully shall reap bountifully. That putting it together for that. And so what we understand is this, is that the first century Christians, they, they understood that there was something that was really bearing down on them. And that was that their lives were not near as important as their eternity. Their lives are not nearly as important as their eternity. Can I tell you where we are? I, I, I read this to Brother, Brother Rose a while ago. I sincerely believe what I'm about to say. I believe that history will say that February the 24th, 2022, was the first day of World War III. I believe that with all my heart. And as we look, we have China ready to attack Taiwan. In fact, the Taiwanese scrambled their jets the other day 
because the Chinese were bearing down on them. Right now in Syria, there is an all-out effort of Russia to take over Syria as they're setting up camp, getting ready to march south into Israel. They've already insulted and assaulted Jordan, and they are now, Iran is moving in the direction of Israel as well. And all of a sudden, we see the 38th and 39th chapter of the book of Ezekiel all coming together. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, when you get home this evening, remember to read Ezekiel 38 and 39. It will give you a total description and insight on exactly what's happening. Let me help you just a little bit. It talks about two cities in Gog and Magog. To understand that that is Russia, Meshach is now modern Moscow. Tubal is now the Siberian capital of Tobolsk. What I was shocked to find out today is one of the number one tourist areas in Russia is Siberia and Tobolsk. I can't imagine wanting to go there so cold. Of course, I, I can't imagine wanting to go, what's the place in Colorado they go to ski? ski? Aspen? Why do I want to go spend a week in frigid weather when I pray for the sun to shine here again? But Tobolsk is that capital area of Siberia. Meshach is Moscow, the capital area of that. It names off the countries that are involved. And when it names them, it names Persia. That's Iran. It names Libya. It, it names all, uh, Somalia is an area. They refer to it as Ethiopia. But all of those lands around there are making their move now. And they are launching their efforts. And uh, uh, hear me tell you this. Maybe I'm getting ahead of myself even on some Bible studies on Sunday night. But I want to tell you something. And that is that the Lord Jesus Christ is coming. And the sad thing about it is that the Red Rider, which is the nation of Russia and China, the Red Nation, if I could just tell you this, they're saddling the red horse. They're getting ready to ride. And uh, that doesn't happen until after the rapture. So I just want you to know, when you take that into mindset, this is how close <coughs> we are to the rapture of the church. And we see it falling in place. Jesus, help us. So choose your values. <coughs> choose your values. And choosing your values, we want to walk ahead with the Lord. And walking on with the Lord, let me tell you something. You know, people say judge not lest you be judged with the same judgment. When you're looking at people's lives, Brother Kitchen said that if you drive by and you see a red barn and you say that's a red barn said you're not judging it you're just stating a fact so he also said this the scripture said this that good trees don't bring forth bad fruit and bad fruit bad trees don't bring forth good fruit Simply saying this then, he went on to say, by your fruits, you'll know them. When you understand that, I want you to know that it's very, very important to have consistency in your life. Let me stop here. Thank you very much. Let me, let me stop here and say this quickly. And that is, we all like grand things to happen in the Holy Ghost. We all like that. But one of the things that you've got to make sure of is there is a difference between these three words, spectacular and spiritual and sensational. 
I will tell you that I've seen a lot of things happen in church that was absolutely spectacular. I've also seen a lot of things happen in church that were absolutely just, just take your breath. Spectacular and uh, special in every way. But sensational. But I do want to tell you this. The very best that we can do is to be people that have the fruit of the Spirit. Because it doesn't matter how spectacular something is, or even the person that's claiming to do it, or what the outcome is with what they are doing. The bottom line, when it's over, said, and done, they have got to be spiritual. And spirituality is measured by the fruit of the Spirit. If you'd like for me, just put this on the screen for me. First of all, here's the thing. It's awful easy to get wrapped up in the spectacular and, and, and the sensational and realize and not realize that people's flesh can produce such things. I want you to look at this. Galatians, if you would, 5th chapter, verses 19, 20, and 21. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulation, wrath, strife, sedition, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, reveling, and such like, of the which I tell you before, and I've also told you in times past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So don't let anybody's sensationalism or spectacularism deceive you. This is what determines whether somebody's spiritual or not. Go back if you read and take me back to the 16th verse, same chapter in Galatians, 5th chapter, verses 16, 17, and 18. Watch this. Then I say, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that you could not do the things which you would. Here it is. But if you be led of the spirit, you are not under the law. Do you understand that? Now if you will, Drop down, and I'd like for you to give to me verse number 19. Excuse me. I'd, I'd like to go down and uh, uh, get, give me, yes, verse number 19. The works of the flesh, nevertheless. I, I missed something here. Go on down to the, go on down to the 22nd verse. There's what I was looking for. I got a good mind. I just got to chase it down every now and then. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. Now, let me stop here and tell you something. It doesn't say fruits of the Spirit. It said fruit. And the fruit of the Spirit is love. Everybody say love. One fruit, and it's love. And if you have love, you'll have joy. Come on. If you have love, you'll have peace. If you have love, you'll practice long-suffering. If you have love, you'll be gentle. If you have love, you'll be goodness. If you have love, you'll have faith. Are we all right? If you'll have love, you'll be meek. If you have love, you'll be temperate. And against love, there is no law. That's the reason that, that love, one for another, is the great tribute. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, because you have love one toward the other. Somebody ought to say hallelujah. 
So we want to keep it in our mind that we are walking in this. And remember something. Out of the abundance of the heart, look at Matthew 12 and 34. Matthew 12 and 34 has something strong to say. Here it is. O generation of vipers, how can you bring evil, speak good, th you being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. You know, and I want you to know that it's very important to be careful with what you say. Now, Luke 6 and 48. I'm going to bring this to a close. Luke 6 and verse 48. If you believe what Jesus said to do, he is like a man which built a house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, and the stream beat vehemently upon the house, could not shake it, for it was founded on the rock. That rock is Jesus. Oh, he's the one. That rock is Jesus. The only one. Be very sure. Be very sure. That anchor holds and grips the solid rock. That rock is Jesus. Yes, he's the one. That rock is Jesus. The only one. Be very sure. Be very sure. Your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. In times like these, times like right now, we need an anchor. In times like these, we need a Savior. Be very sure. Be very sure. Your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. That rock is Jesus. Oh, he is the one. That rock is Jesus, the only one. Be very sure. Be very sure. Your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. Let's gather around the altar. Come on. Let's come and get an anchor deep in that rock. Oh, yes. Let's choose the teachings of Jesus.